We have covered the perils that lie off the coast of the region, and some of the ships that have met their fate in the cold waters of the North Sea before. Whether it's through acts of war like the SS Canterbury and the HMS Umpire, or tragic accidents in the dark of night like the SS Elbe. But today we will cover a wreck that predates all of these ships. A ship built for war, proven in battle, that fell victim to the power of nature. The somewhat ironically named HMS Invincible. There have been several HMS Invincibles in the long history of the Royal Navy, but the one we will cover today was launched on the 9th of March 1765 in Deptford. She was a 74-gun, third-rate ship of the line. She measured 51.37 metres long and 14.40 metres wide on her beam. She was launched at a strange time for the Royal Navy. There were no real wars to fight, with the Seven Years' War ending two years previous. So, she would find herself and her crew languishing mostly, until a new conflict would raise its head again. And raise its head it would. Eleven years after her launch, war broke out. The first of her many large-scale conflicts, the American Revolution. She would see action in the often untalked-about European theatre of the war, taking part in the Battle of St Vincent off the coast of Portugal as part of the wider Siege of Gibraltar, where she would suffer three dead and four wounded. Closer to the Americas, she was present, but not part, of the Battle of the Chesapeake. It would be one of the final nails in the coffin for British rule over the 13 colonies. The January of 1782 would find her in the Caribbean, taking part in the Battle of St Kitts, leading to another British victory where she suffered only two men wounded. Later wars would see her take part in what came to be known as the glorious 1st of June by the French in 1794, where she would suffer 10 dead with 21 wounded. On the 17th of February 1797, she took part in the invasion of Trinidad that saw Spanish forces ousted and the island fall under British occupation. So all in all, she had a rather proud record of service in the cause of her nation when she sailed back to Britain and dropped anchor in Chatham. But ships of her type, with such a battle-hardened crew, were never particularly left to rest for long, especially during wars. Her final voyage would begin in March of 1801. Word would arrive that the Admiralty was planning an attack on the Danish fleet in Copenhagen, a kind of preemptive attack, as the fears were high that this powerful fleet could fall into the hands of the French and be used against the British. HMS Invincible was to join the British fleet under the command of Admiral Sir Hyde Parker and Norfolk-born hero of the Battle of the Nile, Horatio Nelson. They sailed out of Chatham, heading north, with a crew of 600, under the command of Rear Admiral Thomas Totty and the newly appointed ship's captain, John Rennie. Reaching the coast of Norfolk, she docked in Great Yarmouth to collect her final orders and to onload supplies needed for the voyage and the battle. On the 16th of March, 1801, with all preparations finalised and with the ship's master and pilot on board to help them through the waters off the coast, they sailed out to sea. It would be the last time either her or many of her crew would ever see port. Despite the aid of the ship's master and the pilot to guide her through the dangers of the ever-shifting sandbanks known collectively as the Haysborough Sands, it would be the weather that would bring about her downfall. A strong wind, mixed with a rising tide, soon made her difficult to control, forcing her directly onto Hammond's Knoll sandbank. Stuck fast, the force of the wind and the waves now began to tear the ship apart. The crew sprang into action, doing all they could to try and save the ship and themselves. The mizzen masts were cut away to try and stop the effect of the wind, and all over the ship, men began to throw the newly acquired provisions over the side, hoping to reduce the weight of the vessel and get her floating again. Among the provisions now overboard were over 150 barrels of brandy, many of which were handed over to customs officers when discovered. But not all, with many disappearing into the homes of locals, with one man even said to have drunk himself to death on his plunder. The noise going on on board must have been unimaginable. The crashing of the waves hitting hard into the ship, the cracking and breaking of wood from the masts and the hull, the general panic of the crew, and above this, the deafening sound of the ship's cannons firing in distress, hoping to get the attention of other vessels. For a moment, it looked as though the crew may have saved themselves. The ship raised from the sandbank and began to float away. Sadly, mere moments later, a heavy sea swell crashed into her, breaking her rudder, leaving her totally uncontrollable, and pushing her back onto Hammond Sands. There was little they could do now, except man the ship's pumps, and hope they could keep her afloat long enough to help to reach them. They were only a few miles off the coast, and their distress signals were heard by a passing collier ship, Hunter. 
but for reasons known only to her crew, the calls were ignored and she sailed past on her way to port in Yarmouth. The only ship that came to her aid was a fishing smack called the Nancy, sailing from Yarmouth on the hunt for cod. Her skipper, Daniel Gridson, brought her as close as he could and dropped anchor, offering his help in any way he could. As time ticks along, it became clear there was no way to save the ship, and steps for evacuation began. It was about midnight when the ship's boats were lowered into the water and made for the waiting Nancy. The first carried Rear Admiral Totty, four midshipmen, the youngest members of the crew, and some other crewmen. The second boat was carrying just crew members. They reached the Nancy safely and returned to the HMS Invincible to collect more. The second run would not be as successful. As one of the boats pulled away from the Invincible, it was caught by a heavy wave capsizing it, throwing all on board into the water. For them, it would have been almost certain death had it not been for a second passing ship that had seen the commotion and come to lend a hand who was able to rescue them. The Nancy and this second ship, a different collier ship, spent the night saving all the crew they could, but there was nothing that could be done to save the Invincible herself. In the morning, the rising sun brought nothing in the way of relief or hope. A shift in the tide lifted the Invincible once again from the sandbank and carried her into deeper waters, and with her hull irrecoverably damaged, she began to sink fast. The crew, who were still on board the ship, were seen throwing themselves into the sea and trying to swim for either of their rescuers or the ship's boats heading backwards and forwards. Some of them made it, but many of them didn't, including those physically pushed away from the ship's boats by those manning them, who feared that the rush of men would cause them to capsize. When the HMS Invincible finally slipped beneath the waves, of the 600 crew she had left Chatham with, only 190 were left. For comparison, the Battle of Copenhagen she was meant to take part in, led to the deaths of 253 British sailors. Among the dead was Captain Rennie. Standing on naval tradition, he was reported as the last man to leave his post. He was last seen swimming for one of the boats, only seemingly to give up part way, raise his arms above his head and allow himself to calmly sink and drown. As with all naval sinkings, a court-martial was held by the Admiralty. This one took place on board HMS Ruby in Sheerness. As the surviving senior officer, Rear Admiral Totty had to answer the majority of the questions. He spoke highly of Captain Rennie, describing the final moments of the Invincible as such. The ship went down in 13 fathoms of water, and out of the 600 persons that had belonged to the Invincible, they have not been above 190 saved and now living. Several who were picked up by the launch died very soon afterwards. I am extremely grieved to inform that Captain Rennie was among the number who've drowned. By his death, the service has lost a truly zealous and intelligent officer. The horror of the scene at the moment the ship went down far exceeds all powers of description. Both Totty and Rennie were cleared of any blame in the sinking. Instead, the fault was laid at the door of the harbour pilot and the ship's master, who were there to guide the ship through such a dangerous area, and who should have known of the nearby sandbank. And, as both men had been killed in the sinking, they were easy targets for such criticism. As for the crew, the actions of all were praised as highly meritorious. The Battle of Copenhagen was a success for the Royal Navy, with 12 Danish ships captured, two sunk and one destroyed, ending the threat of Danish ships falling into the hands of the French, for the time being anyway. On his way back from the battle, Nelson made a point to stop in Great Yarmouth and visit the injured survivors of the HMS Invincible, who were being treated in the local hospital, referring to them as his men. Many of the bodies of those lost when the ship went down were to wash up along the shore over the following days. They were collected, loaded into horse-drawn carts, and buried in unconsecrated ground in an unmarked mass grave just north of the Haysborough Church. Six bodies, who washed up further along the coast, were buried in the churchyard of Holy Trinity and All Saints Church in Winterton on the 20th of March, 1801. But who these six were, we will never know. The men killed in the sinking would lay mostly forgotten for over a hundred years, until 1913, a campaign was launched by a Mary Catter who wanted to erect a monument to them at the mass grave site in Haysborough. Money was raised and then a snag was hit. With the passing of time, it was no longer known where the bodies were buried. The idea was dropped and the money was returned. But Mary was not prepared to give up so easily. Eleven years later, when it came time for the church to rehang their bells, Mary raised funds, this time for a new treble bell, bearing the inscription, in memory of Nelson's men, wrecked off Haysborough, in 1801, and this could have been all they would ever get in the way of a memorial had it not been for a chance discovery decades later. It was 1988. The old unconsecrated ground 
had now been incorporated into the churchyard, and work was underway digging a drainage ditch, when a mass of skeletons were found, buried about three foot under the surface. The mass grave had been uncovered. The bodies were dug up and stored until they were given a proper burial with proper rites ten years later in 1998. The spot of the new burial is marked with a memorial stone laid by members of the crew of the aircraft carrier that now bore the name HMS Invincible, members of the Nelson Society and others. The inscription on the memorial reads, On 16th March 1801, HMS Invincible was wrecked off Haysborough when on her way to join the fleet with Admiral Nelson at Copenhagen. The day following, the ship sank with the loss of some 400 lives. 119 members of the ship's company lie buried here, and the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Revelations 26.13 The seas off Norfolk would, and still do, remain a dangerous place for seafarers. But with improved charts and new sonar systems, disasters have been greatly reduced. Also, a great deal of credit must go to the men and women of the RNLI, who willingly go out into these dangers when they must. Follow the link on screen to hear about one of these men, Henry Block, largely considered the greatest lifeboatman. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. This was the final voyage of the HMS Invincible. This was a little bit of history.